Hey guys, what's up? My name is Gabe and this is Games with Gabe and this is the next episode in the coding a 2D physics engine in Java series. Now in this episode there is going to be no coding, instead we are going to be taking a look at Box 2D Lite, written by Aaron Cotto. Now the reason we're looking at his source code is because he has a really nice solution to resolving box versus box collisions, which is our, the next step in our physics engine. So specifically, what we need is some way to figure out what the collision points between these two boxes are the collision normal, which would look something like this, an arrow pointing in this direction, and the separation amount, which is this value right here. So how much are they separated by? This is a really hard problem to solve. And so we're gonna walk through Aaron Cotto's code line by line inside a box 2D light, and basically just see exactly what he does and try and understand how his solution works. So not only will this be a tutorial in sort of physics, but this is mostly a tutorial in looking through somebody else's code and understanding how it works, figuring out how it works, not just seeing the code, but really truly understanding why it works the way it works. So we're going to take this in several different pieces. Uh, let's get started by looking at the first piece. Okay, so the code we will be looking at is taken directly from Aaron Cotto's repository on GitHub. There will be a link in the description, and specifically we'll be focusing mainly on this collide.cpp file inside a source, so source slash collide.cpp. I've copied and pasted this into a Visual Studio solution because it is simply easier for me to type in notes and stuff and remind myself of what he's doing. He has some notes, but uh, in my opinion, it's not extensive enough to really understand what's going on. So starting at line 164 or around there, it may be a little bit different because of the things I've taken and removed. You can see he has this collide function and this is basically the meat. This is where we find those contact points. We take in two rectangles, two boxes, and we find the contact points, the separation, and we put them inside of here. Let's just walk through it line by line with a specific example and see how it works. Now I'm gonna set up an example inside of our note taker so that we can follow along with a concrete example and see how this works. All right, so I'm going to be working through the simplest form of this problem that we would ever encounter because we're using real numbers and it is always easier to use something simple. So we've got two boxes here and the center of this box is right here. The center of this box is right about there. And you can see that this box is colliding with this one and they are all lined up to the grid behind it for ease of our number crunching. Now this one I'm gonna say is colliding this depth, I'm gonna say is about 0.1 just so that we have all that in reference, okay? So let's take a look at how Aaron Cotto's code says we should solve this. And the way we're gonna do this is we're literally just going to go through his code line by line, write out the variables and then just work on it, work on the problem from this point of view. Okay, so he says first we need to set up the problem and to do that we get the half width of A and the half width of B. So we say body A's width and body width B's width and these are vector twos by the way too. And you can find all the information for like how these are made just by going into this arbiter.h and some of the other .h files where he has information that we need. So like the definitions. And then he also has these slides, which I will also have posted, which have some useful visualizations and stuff for what exactly we're going through. And we may reference this throughout this tutorial as well. Okay, so we get the half width of A and the half width of B. So let's do that real quick. So we get HA, which is just uh, A is four by four. So half of A is two by two. And this is a vector. The half width of B, which is just one one since B is two by two. And I'm also gonna sort of number out my steps in the order that we're going. So this is sort of step number one, the first segment in the code. And then I will try and number the code accordingly too so that we can sort of follow along. So this is step one and I'll move that up. Okay, so we get the half width of A, half width of B. Let's get the position of A and the position of B. Now this is where we have liberty to make up whatever position we want and I'm gonna make this easy for ourselves and just say that this is at 2, 2. So if that's at 2, 2, then we can say pose A equals 2, 2. And then that would mean pose B equals, so if we go 2, then that would be uh, 1. And I'm going to say this is 0.9 over. So that would be at 4.9. 
and the height would also be two. Okay, so position of A and position of B, we have those. What does the next part of the code say? Uh, we get this rotation matrix, rotation A and rotation B. And if we take a look at Aaron Cotto's code uh, inside of the mathutils.h, and we take a look at mat two by two, which is just a two by two matrix. When you put it in an angle, it basically just constructs a two by two matrix where it goes cosine of the angle, negative sine angle, sine angle, and cosine angle. So if we were to make a matrix, that would look like cosine angle, sine of the negative sine of the angle, sine of the angle, cosine of the angle. Well, we have it really easy. These boxes are rotated at zero degrees. So if we remember from trigonometry that the cosine graph looks something like this, where it intersects at one at the y-axis, the sine graph looks like this, where it's just starting at the origin, and then we can see that the rotation matrices would just be, so cosine of this is one at zero, negative sine of zero is zero, sine of zero is zero, cosine of zero is one. And if you know some linear algebra, this is the identity matrix, which will make our lives a heck of a lot easier. But we're going to want to keep in mind that their rotation matrices, both of these rotation matrices, uh, so rotation A equals rotation B equals the identity, so which is just identity of, I guess you could say that's the identity of a two, so it's a two by two identity. It's helpful to keep this in mind and to remember what it is. It's a rotation matrix. It tells us what the rotation is. In other words, this is rotation A. So this is A's x-axis, which is 1, 0. This is A and B's y-axis, which is 0, 1, which are the unit vectors pointing in the direction that A and B are aligned. So if we had a square that looked like this, then this would contain basically two vectors that looked like this. It would basically be like some number x, some positive y, some positive y, some negative x. Okay, so just keep in mind that is what the rotation matrix is. Okay, let's go back and see what the next part of the code takes in. So if we go back to the code, you'll see he gets this thing called dp, da, db. dp is pose b minus pose a. Pose a. So I'm going to call this step two because this is sort of where we are stepping into the next big portion of the code. Okay, so let's just write out this is step two. And we will say now we are at dp, which equals pose b minus pose a. Pose b is uh, 4.92 minus pose a is just 2, 2. So 4.9 minus 2 is 2.9. 2 minus 2 is 0. Okay, simple enough, right? That's dp. Now, what is dA and dB? Well, let's look at this. dA is rotation A times dP. dB is rotation B times dP, okay? So, uh, since rotation A, and that's actually rotation A's transpose, okay? So, I kind of skipped over two lines of code here. This is rotation A's transpose. This will rotate anything into A's local space, okay? And this matrix will rotate anything into B's local space. So basically these two are sort of magic transformations when you multiply them by a vector or another matrix, it rotates that vector into the local space. Now in our case, these are the identity matrices. So when we multiply them by itself, it will give us the same thing. So this will just give us DP. This will also give us DP uh, multiplying by the transpose. And that makes sense because if we look at them, they are in world space, right? They there is nothing to rotate. We aren't rotating these boxes. So if we look at DP, which I will draw as a blue vector, it looks like this. And so that means that if we were to rotate this into A's rotation, well, it is. If we were to rotate this into B's rotation, well, it already is, right? If we look at what he's doing here, he's saying DP is equal to pose B minus pose A. And then he's saying rotate that DP vector into A's local space, rotate that DP vector into B's local space. Okay, so then if we were to actually write this out too, then dA would also equal this 2.90 value. dB would also equal this 2.90 value. All right, because it's already in local space, so they're all the same thing. But if they had been rotated, keep in mind that this would have rotated this vector. So if uh, B was rotated like this, then this vector would actually look like this uh, right here. 
So just keep that in mind. It's always good to keep this stuff in mind because we want to know what's going on. Why is he doing the things he does? Now we get into step three. So this is sort of <laughs> the next part of the code, okay? And what he does here is he creates a matrix that rotates anything from B's local space into A's local space. The way he does that is he basically says uh, rotation A transpose, which remember rotates things into A's local space times B. So what he's doing here is he's basically, basically saying, give me a matrix that transforms things from B to A. Then he takes the transpose of that, which gives us the matrix to make everything in A's local space go into B's local space. So basically, if we multiply these matrices by something, it will rotate anything that was, say, this was some vector in A's local space. And if we multiply it by that matrix, then if B was rotated like this, we would get some vector that looks like this, except the same length. It would just rotate it, okay? So that's all these matrices are, is just some rotations, but there's some very useful rotations. So I'm gonna go ahead and just write out step three. C is the identity, and we'll say this is a matrix that basically rotates things, like I said. So I just said this is a matrix that will rotate anything from B's local space into A's local space, okay? Uh, let's see what he does with that matrix now. So if we continue down, we see that he uses these matrices. So it says box A faces. So what uh, this is happening now is this is basically step four, I'll say. Uh, this is the SAT. So this is the separating axis theorem. We've done this before. He's just doing it in a very compact way, okay? So he says get box A's faces, which is also the separation along box A's normals. And I said here, this does a dot product by using the transformation matrix and matrix multiplication rules. It's very condensed. So what does he do here? He says, okay, <laughs> face A is absolute value of DA minus HA minus absolute value C. Remember, this is a matrix. All right, this is a vector. This is A's half width. This is a matrix. This is B's half width, okay? So he's saying, take the absolute value of DA, take this vector that's in A's local space. Remember, DA is this vector rotating in A's local space. Subtract half of A's width, okay? So we're taking out half of A's width, which would give us uh, basically taking out this much from this vector, which intuitively makes sense if we look at it, minus absolute value of C times HB. Remember what this does. C transforms this into A's local space. So it's saying minus half of B's width in C in A's local space. So what is happening here? It's basically saying, let's just project these onto the X axis, right? And so if we, or, or, and that's A's X axis, right? And so it just so happens that the X axis is A's X axis. So we're just doing projections. So if we were to project this onto this, that would give us uh, this value right here, 2.9. Okay, so we'll say this is like 2.9. If we were to project B's half width onto the x-axis, well, that would just give us two. And if we were to project, I, I'm sorry, this would give us one. And if we were to project A's half width onto the x-axis, well, that would just give us two, right? Because that is uh, projected on the x-axis already because it is. So now what he's saying to do is just subtract uh, 2 and 1 from 2.9, which gives us this value that he calls face A, right? So he says face A just equals 2.9 minus 2 minus 1. And then he does the same thing for the y-axis, all in one operation. He says, okay, now also subtract the, we're projecting things onto the y-axis because that's A's y-axis, and we're going to project this guy's y, which is just 0. So that's 0 and then his half height, which is one, this guy's half height, and this guy's half height, which is two. So zero minus one minus two uh, is what we're getting here. And if we actually do all that math, then what we get is minus 0 0.1 and minus three. Now, what do these numbers mean? What is the significance of these numbers? This is the penetration. 
Okay, this is the penetration along A's axis. This is the separating axis theorem. He just did it in a super condensed form by doing dot products and everything all in one operation. It's insane. But look at this. If we look here, how much space is this? That's minus 0 0.1. Okay, it's technically 0 0.1 because you can't have a negative length. How much is B penetrating A along the Y axis? Well, it's technically three, right? Because we have one whole penetration there two units of penetration here, okay? So what this just gave us is the penetration on the x-axis, the penetration on the y-axis, which is also the penetration on x, A's x-axis and A's y-axis. So if A had actually been orientated like this, then what it would have given us is the amount of penetration along these axes, okay? It would have given us the penetration of B along this axis and along this axis. That's all that is happening here. Literally, this is the separating axis theorem in uh, one line of code. That's all it says. And then what he does here is he says, if either of them is greater than zero, that means there's no penetration along that axis. So we return zero. We're exiting early. Next, he says, find the best axis. What is the best axis? Well, if we look back at our picture, the best axis is the axis with the least amount of penetration, right? And we can intuitively see that here too. The axis we would like to separate this on is this axis right here, the x-axis, since this has the least amount of penetration. Okay, and so what he does is, if we look at the code, he says, uh, let's initialize it to face A's x. So, uh, in other words, that is object A's x-axis, which is this arrow right here, and object A's y-axis is this arrow right here. That also happens to be B's x-axis and y-axis. So he says, let's initialize it to A's x-axis. We'll initialize the separation to face A dot x, which happens to be the uh, penetration amount in that axis. And then the normal is just the rotation matrix column one or negative rotation matrix colon one, depending on whether DA dot x is positive. And what that is saying is basically, if object B is on the right of object A, then we will use uh, this column right here, which just so happens to be A's x-axis, okay, right? So he's basically saying the normal is 1, 0, which if we look at this, it you can see that intuitively. That's true. This is the direction the normal is pointing, right? We're using this normal right here, which is just 1, 0. And then he does this whole thing with relative tolerance and absolute tolerance, which uh, he basically just says, okay, if there's any axes that look better than this, if there's any axes with a least less amount of penetration, then we'll just switch it to that axis. And so he does it with face A's Y axis, then he does it with B's X axis, and then B's Y axis. And he just does four separate if statements to check and see. So that leaves us with the axis of penetration, the separation amount, and the normal. Okay, so this is sort of the big amount of code. The next portion of his code is also pretty difficult. And I think I'm going to leave this for a separate video. So I'm going to cover the rest of this tomorrow and hopefully release that in the next day. We'll see how that goes, okay? Uh, I do want to apologize too real quick for the lack of videos. And that is because I have been working on this. So uh, box versus box collision detection is very difficult. And I just have not looked at it seriously in a long time. So I've been putting it off, putting it off, and I'm finally taking the time to look at it. So hopefully I'll release it. Work has also been pretty difficult, so I have not been able to work on videos as much because I'm working on my job. I'm sorry I haven't been releasing as many videos. It'll probably be down to like one a week. Uh, this week I'll probably be able to do two so that we can get the full explanation of how Box 2D Lights code is working. But I would also like to thank you guys for 800, almost 900 subscribers. <laughs> That's amazing. And if we can go up to 1,000 subscribers, that would be really cool. Okay, that is it for this tutorial though. In the next tutorial, we're going to continue going through this source code so that we can try and see how the rest of this works. Let me know if this is helpful for you guys because it is really important to know how to go through somebody else's code and really understand what's going on. And it's not the easiest thing to do. And I haven't found any tutorials walking through this source code which is a shame because it would be nice if somebody walked through line by line what exactly the source code is doing. So that's what I'm trying to do for you guys. All right, that is it though. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next tutorial.